It's time for another edition of the Penn State Blue White Illustrated Football and Recruiting Podcast. He's Ryan Snyder. I'm Greg Pickle, and it is game week, Penn State fans. We've made it through spring practice, winter workouts, of course, summer camp, and we have now arrived with the Nittany Lions, a five and a half point underdog, ahead of a trip to Wisconsin this weekend. Kickoff set for noon on Fox. We're going to get to that a little bit later in today's show, but first, as always, we're going to start with a focus on recruiting. Penn State's uh, class of 2022, almost full as we know, but that means there's a lot of guys to track during the high school football season, which kicked off across the country for those that didn't start the week before. Everyone, for the most part, played their first game this past weekend. Ryan, before we get into a few players to highlight, just what were your general thoughts of what you expected from Penn State's class of 2022 commits versus what you saw and read? Obviously, there were some huge numbers put up in week one by a number of guys. Yeah, I mean, we have highlight films. Uh, uh, I've been trying to search uh, NFHS network, which is, you know, where you get a lot of, um, you know, full games. Uh, and a couple guys have some stuff up. I was trying to watch Drew Alar's full game the other night, and the video is so hard to watch, man. It, I was going to try and cut some clips for everybody, but it's it's so hard to see. So um, I, I was a little disappointed just for, from you and I perspective. Central PA, it's Friday night, kind of got all messed right. up a bit. Uh, you know, you traveled down to Mannheim Township and it's all nothing. And at least I get to, I got to watch Bishop McDevitt a bit, but of course Abdul Carter didn't play. Uh, so that, that first week zero or week one, whatever you want to call it, it was a, a bit of a bust locally. But, uh, you know, for the most part, what, what we've seen is uh, Penn State's guys putting up some great stats, which is what you expected. You know, Bo Prebula, Nick Singleton, Drew Allar, uh, all these guys, they've been putting up uh, awesome stats for years now. So to expect, expect anything different, uh, for, for week one of their senior years would have been silly. So we are going to start with Drew Alar. You have cut some highlights of him. A really impressive performance here. And again, you know, I don't want to overhype any of these guys because they wouldn't be coming to Penn State if they're not dominating their high school circuit. That's just the way it is. I mean, that's when you see these guys out there, like he threw for 350 yards, four touchdowns, a 34-14 win. I mean, he's the whole package, and we knew that. It's why Mike Yersich made him a priority. But Ryan... Uh, sometimes I guess you just like to see it again to make sure that what you thought you saw either last season or during the off season was accurate. And with Drew, that's absolutely the case. Yeah, well, especially because Drew's rise was all about the summer, you know. So uh, I mean, last last season I wasn't even watching him. You know, I didn't, I didn't. Uh, you know, we knew Penn State was interested in a second quarterback, but it wasn't until Yurchit arrived that you know Drew really emerged onto the scene. So really getting to focus on his games this year kind of be the first time I. I really do that. Uh, but you, you mentioned some of the stats there. I have a little more specifics here. 15 of 28 attempts, uh, 246 yards passing, two touchdowns, and he did throw one interception. Uh, he also rushed the ball 13 times for 104 yards, which I believe is a bit more than his average. Uh, I don't have all of his rushing stats from you know each game last year, but yeah. 13 rushes I believe is a, a bit higher than normal. I know I know some Penn State fans were cringing uh, when they were watching the highlight films and seeing some of the hits he was taking, but uh, he, he's a big guy. He can handle it. You know he runs a four nine ish forty. Uh, he's not a burner or anything like that, but he makes smart decisions. You know when when he uh, has an opening, he takes it, which is what you want to see. So uh, another just solid win for Medina. Uh, Avon's a pretty good program. Uh, they they. Uh, the, those two schools were pretty much ranked right with each other going into this game. I believe it was like 17th and 18th on yes. max preps. Look, their their rankings only mean so much. It's kind of a computer formula more than anything. But mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I saw actually uh, Medina's I believe up to number two in in Cleveland.com's I think regional poll. Uh, so that'll be something to watch. Uh, they they seem to be getting a lot of attention. So uh, they they face Wadsworth this upcoming weekend. They they should get a pretty easy win there. Stoke. Stowe Monroe, then they face the following weekend. They're they're a decent squad. They they should be top twenty five or so in Ohio. But uh, for me, the the film I really want to watch for Drew Alar is is that showdown with Mentor here on October one. I'm, I have it penciled in right now for a game I want to attend. Mentor is always just one of those elite programs uh, in the in the Cleveland area. They have Brennan Vernon, uh, Notre Dame commit right now. So looking forward to seeing what he can do against one of the deeper squads in Ohio in a couple weeks, and you know also dealing with an elite pass rusher off the edge. But you know as expected, Drew put up great stats. Uh, he's a little inaccurate at times. I was going to that. say that's the one thing that Penn State fans really kind of have clung to maybe a little bit. Is it? The first two weeks, his completion percentage has not been necessarily the, the greatest thing to write home about. I mean, where are you at on that? Is it a concern for you? Is it just the way it is? Have it's you got enough? Just the, yeah. 
yeah, his footwork just needs to improve a bit more. You know, when he when he gets outside the pocket and, and tries to make plays, uh, that's when he kind of gets a bit inaccurate. So that's kind of that's what I see at least there. Um, but and and that's kind of why you know camps are only you can only gain so much from that. You know what I mean? It, it, you don't you don't really have that pressure in the camp situations and you know leading up to those pressure moments in Elite Eleven, you're just getting uh, you know fed fed you know. Uh, different tips and whatnot to, to work on your footwork. So he's always kind of perfect in those situations and, and cognitive of it. So um, look, it's, I think he's doing fine. He's making great plays. His team's two and oh, I don't think there's, there's a whole lot to complain about. He's, he's, he's a heck of a player uh, just like the other quarterback we're going to talk about. I was going to say, let's move on to Bo Prabola. Another impressive performance for him in a high school career. That's just full of them. I saw him as seven on seven back in the summer, and I really thought he looked like a little bit of a different player in a good way, Ryan. And I think I saw some of those same things in his highlights and game film from this past weekend. I mean, he's just such a he's a little bit bigger now. He's a little bit more accurate. His arm strength looks to be a little bit better. It's not elite. I don't think it's going to be at any point. But, you know, I saw that that's not a bad Exeter Township team that they beat. And obviously, it got a little bit closer at the end. But. Um, just your takeaways from that Penn state, obviously wants two quarterbacks in this class and they both sh- uh, showed up in a big way during the uh, last weekend of games. Yeah. Uh, Joey Schaefer, of course, 2023 player from Exeter and, and J.R. Strauss, who's, he's a solid linebacker committed to Villanova. So they, they have some talent on that Exeter township squad, uh, 17 for 24, uh, 337 yards passing and four touchdowns and a 35-28 win. Uh, he also had the the a rushing touchdown too. So he he you know he he uh, accounted for all of Central York's points, uh, which we've seen many times with him. I was going to say t- that's the uh, dime a dozen for him, right? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, arm strength has always been the thing with Bo. You know, if, if that if that can continue to improve and it, you know, I, I want to see him a bit more in person before I, I really get a better feel for how how much his arm strength improved in the summertime. I I felt maybe, you know, we saw some throws where it felt like that, but then there was also some kind of intermediate throws where, you know, you want to see a bit more zip on the ball. He can, he can get it downfield. It's really those, those, when you're in a tight situation, you know, trying to thread it between linebackers where I I think you want to see more zip on it, but man, Bo's a winner. That's what I love about Bo. He's just a winner. Central York, Central York has never been a powerhouse program. Now, look, they had some really good players last year, uh, and they still have some some good. This is definitely one of their better groups. But uh, you know, to, to lead your team all the way uh, to, the, to the state championship last year, and you know that was due to some some circumstances. They've missed out on playing some good teams that this year they they won't be able to avoid the way the playoffs are set up. But um, that's that's just what I love about Bo, man. I, I kind of feel like Bo's been slept on a bit this summer because of how much attention drew alar has gotten and and i don't want to take it away from drew i mean he's earned everything that he's he's gotten so far but you know i think penn state uh, there's there's penn state fans who like already i feel kind of pencil in drew alar as as the next quarterback oh absolutely and and i i just think that's silly man because we you know we've seen it how many examples over the years have you seen the the top guy come into penn state and you know he gets beat out by someone who's slightly ranked below and and you know bo was a four star for a long time he dropped he dropped to a three star basically because you know his, his camp performances were all good he just never was the top guy at the camp he was always like the third best guy and that that was kind of the mindset behind dropping him there but i love bo man i think this guy's a winner he's definitely you know, the one thing he does have over Alar is his athleticism. You know, he, he can run a legit, you know, four high four six, low four seven kind of forty. And um, you know, he, he always just makes great decisions too. So it's gonna be fun watching these guys progress over the years. I, I I'm looking forward to seeing Bo uh play a play a few more teams. He actually plays Cumma Valley this upcoming weekend, who uh their their Cumma Valley's head coach, Josh Oswald, was Bo's previous head coach before right. he decided to go to CV. So I'm sure he'll be a little extra motivated for that one this weekend. Looking forward yeah, to seeing that. Film. You know, the way that, that Alar's kind of been already anointed, the, the next starting quarterback at Penn State, it gives you a little bit of a, a feeling of the recruitment where uh, Andre Robinson, I think a lot of people thought, would be the starting running back when him and Saquon Barkley came in together. And obviously that – uh, didn't work out that way. I'm not saying this is going to work out in a similar way, but it just you get a little bit of that vibe. And I remember back then when those two guys were coming here, there were a lot of people certain that Andre Robinson was going to be the starting and star tailback at Penn State. And there's a 
little bit of that that you get in, in when people talk about these two. But, you know, again, the takeaway for me is let him get to campus and compete with Taquan Roberson, with Christian Bayou. Let them come up here and see what they can do after what we hope would be a healthy and strong senior season for each. And, uh, you know, when you talk about running backs and strong performances, it's a good segue to Nick Singleton, who – this guy, talk about kids that are maybe slept on a little bit, and I think it's because he plays at Governor Mifflin, which is a big school, but he's not necessarily the – he's not all over social media. He doesn't really hit the the camp circuit, or if he did, it would be no. unbeknownst to me. So no. um, this guy is somebody who I think as the highlights keep rolling out, Ryan, he is going to get more and more attention nationally because – he just is a monster out there on the field. I mean, he always was. Again, that's part of why a school like Penn State recruits a guy like Nick Singleton. But, man, mm-hmm. when you watch these senior season highlights, it's really hard not to stop and think, wow, look at what Penn State has coming. It, the latest running back in the pipeline. Obviously, Catron Allen's had some great moments so far, too. But, man, Nick Singleton's just something else when you watch his tape. Yeah, I love him. And, and you're right with he's being slept on. He's definitely being slept on by rivals. I'll, I'll say that. You know, I feel like he's a top 100 player. I know 247 has him very high. I, I don't – I think that might be just a tiny bit too high. Uh, but but I, to me, you know, Nick Singleton's a 60 to 80, you know, kind of player nationally. Um, you know, just if I was ranking it, that's that's kind of where I would have him. So, uh, but yeah, rushed for 281 yards, uh, five touchdowns. Man, he averaged 15 yards per carry, which – you know, it sounds awesome, but he's kind of done that for a year plus now. Uh, you know, York's an okay squad. They they did, I believe they made it to the District 3 Championship last year, but, you know, last year was just kind of all messed up. So uh, he, he's a monster, man. You know, if he runs a 4-5-40, a 4-2 shuttle, you know, had a 30-foot, 6-inch triple broad jump. I mean, he, he's, he's, he's a beast. Um, you know, and he's at 215 pounds too. So uh, this upcoming weekend, though, against Wilson, Wilson had a good win over Central Dolphin last week. This will be maybe his his best test of the of the regular season. Uh, I I expect Governor Mifflin to to kind of roll uh, through their regular season and, and be a serious uh, state championship contender in that 5A level. I you know anyone who remembers that Pine Ridge game in the semifinals last year, they 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 should have been the state championship. They kind of blew it. So. Uh, Looking forward to seeing Nick and, and Governor Mifflin try to uh, redeem themselves this year. But uh, everything about this kid is, is a top 100 player, in my opinion. And he's a top 100 person, too. I mean, just off the field, everything, you know, uh, you, you couldn't ask for for a better leader and, and someone for that locker room in the years to come. Absolutely. I mean, he's a guy who on and off the field, we all have we have a couple of us have connections with people with Governor Mifflin and they just rave about Nick Singleton on and off the field. And when you hear James Franklin talk about what they're looking for in recruits, yeah, they want the guy who, as you watch during the highlight videos, if you're watching us on YouTube, youtube.com slash blue white illustrated, but he hits a hole and he goes and he can stiff arm guys and go, and he can do just a little bit of everything. And of course you're looking for that, but you want the off field locker room, et cetera, component to match that. And by every single intention or uh, by every single count, rather, uh, Nick Singleton, it checks all the boxes. So really good player. Can't wait to see more of him. And uh, the last clip we'll look at here before chatting about a couple other guys, and then we'll move on to some Penn State Wisconsin talk is KJ Winston. And I'll be honest, I did not get the chance to watch what he did. So I'll be curious to watch this live as you fill us in. But, um, you know, Penn State and and one thing that, you know, we're, that we didn't mention here, but when you talk about the secondary, Cam Miller obviously had a, a kick return touchdown. I think plenty of people saw that on social media. But this secondary group they have, to me, Ryan, is just kind of freaky in terms of athleticism and in terms of just raw talent. And KJ Winston's another one of those guys where you watch him. I know he was one of the three players you picked to outplay their rating this year. And uh, it's not really difficult to see why. Yeah. Um, you know, KJ, as far as like, I agree with you on a, on a lot of the secondary guys. KJ doesn't have those as freaky of, of 40 numbers and whatnot. They love his length. He's just a gamer, man. I mean, he, you saw right there another interception this week. He's great at reading the quarterback, stepping up in front of throws and making plays. Uh, the stats I had were nine nine tackles, one interception, you know, 28-7 win over Holy Spirit. Um, but I, I just I wanted to get him in here because his highlights were kind of posted late last night. I didn't I assumed a lot of fans haven't seen him yet. Uh, and, I, and I expect a lot of, you know, I expect a huge season from KJ. I'm actually going down to Philadelphia this weekend. They play Emotep, man, and this is a this is a game I've had circled for a long time. So I'm just looking forward to to seeing what what 
he and DeMatha get to do against one of Pennsylvania's best squads. But, you know, as I said, you know, I, I love KJ. I think he's great at, like I said, forcing turnovers. He's, he's a smart player. Uh, love his wingspan. You kind of saw it there. Um, you know, he, he did get beat there, and he redeemed himself catching up and, and breaking up that pass. So uh, this is a player who, like I said, I think he's a four-star player. He's three right now in rivals, and um, I'd like to see them seriously consider moving him up in the months to come. I think the biggest takeaway I have from it, I know you have some stats for guys like Katron Allen, Ken Talley, Tyler Johnson. We'll get there in a sec. There was a great matchup that, unfortunately, uh, we neither one of us could make between Anthony mm-hmm. Ivey and, and Mikai Flowers. We'll get to that in a second. But the one thing that when I look at the players in this class, for the most part, not every single one of them, but for the most part, they play for really good teams who play really mm-hmm. good competition. And so you really do get a true sense of, you know, they're not always, I mean, don't get me wrong, not, they're not playing D1 or D2 talent every single week, but they're more often than not, most of these guys are playing against really good high school competition. And I think it tells you so much more than these other instances where in years past, and look, where a kid plays and where he grows up and goes to high school is not his fault, but it's certainly much wow. easier to get a read on a guy when he's playing 4A or 5A or 6A, what have you, in PA or elsewhere than if he's playing 1A or 2A or, you know, he's playing for a school that's in a division that, that has won 27 state or, uh, state titles in a row and just destroy mm-hmm. everyone every week. That's one thing I think that's really neat about this class. And to your point, KJ Winston's a gamer, Ryan, but there are, this is a class full of them. You know, when you watch these guys play, for the most part, they all just get after it. And there's not – a lot of wasted movement. There's not, uh, you know, they're they're willing to go hit guys if they play defense. They're willing to take a hit if they play offense. I mean, it's just a really enjoyable group to watch when you sit down and sift through all the highlights and stats week in and week out. Yeah, I really like what you said there as far as guys playing for top high schools. And that is definitely uh, something we see in this class um, more than in previous years. I mean, you can just roll through, you know, Abdul Carter at LaSalle, that's, you know, they're, they're a top program. I just watched them this past weekend. They dominated Bishop McDevitt without their two best players in Carter and Sam Brown. I mean, Cam Miller made that move to Trinity Christian in, in Jacksonville. They're the, I believe, the defending 3A Florida mm-hmm. champions. You know, McDonough, everybody knows about that. Jordan Allen at Lafayette Christian. You know, Lafayette Christian, I believe, was also a state champion last year. They were off to a bit of a slow start this year, but another very solid program. You know, I, I would argue, like, as the lesser program, Central York's probably, you know, towards the bottom of that list. And, of course, Bo Pribulo led them to a state championship last year. But you can just go on and on. You know, also, Caleb Bardis, St. Francis, they're kind of a, a smaller, you know, all New York City schools, you know, aside sure. from Mass. Uh, um, Erasmus, you know, for the most part, they don't produce a ton of talent. So we can go on and on about that. Uh, like, like I said, I, I did want to mention just a couple other stats quick. Katron Allen, Bishop Sycamore. Can we talk about Bishop Sycamore? They, yeah, always, yeah, let's. The let's uh, yeah. And DeMath is actually going to play them. I, I'm supposed to play them. I don't know if that game will get canceled or not. But let me roll through a couple stats here. 162, two touchdowns for Katron Allen. I think anyone who watched that first quarter, and then there was a monster delay for 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 lightning um i think he played maybe half the second quarter he just he rolled through that team uh, which is what you expect he, w- w- mm-hmm. watching him watching him against american heritage the week before seeing some of the highlights from that uh, you, you knew he was gonna have a monster game uh tyler johnson so they played liberty christian which is one of the top programs in virginia they got blown out 60 to 14 magna vista uh, did you know, they're just, they're not, Magna Vista has some talent sometimes, but they're not very deep this year. But Johnson did have 105 yards receiving and, and both of his team's touchdowns. I'm really trying to see those highlights or or some of the film from that. I'm, I'm trying to get that here in the days to come. Uh, and Ken Talley, I want to mention four solo tackles, 11 assisted. I believe it was three tackles for loss, two sacks. Uh, anyone who watched that game, uh, Northeast really kind of just killed themselves uh, with so many turnovers there in that first half, and they, they put themselves in a hole. But but Ken held his own, um, and I, I thought it was a solid, solid you know first first performance for him. So yeah, Bishop Sycamore, the story that apparently keeps on giving. We're recording this Tuesday morning, and I don't think we've heard the end of that saga yet. If you've somehow not heard about it, they are a uh, online uh, sort of uh, school. I don't know if even school is the right word to use at this point. We're going to have to wait and see. But um, long story short is it's believed they have postgraduate players, guys that aren't in high school, guys with uh, using names that are not necessarily their names. It's a bit of an absolute mess right now, and ESPN somehow got – uh, through its uh, uh, agency that it uses to book these high school matchups got kind of duped into showing that game. And it obviously yeah. has uh, been the talk of Twitter and social media for the last few days since that contest happened. 
yeah, I feel bad for those kids more than anything. You know, they're just trying to get their names out there, and it, it feels like some some coaches or you know just adults are, are kind of taking right. advantage of the situation. Oh, well, I saw the I guess the you know whoever's leading that program tried to do this previously, and and then it got shut down, and now he's trying to do it again. I I actually was trying to look up Bishop Sycamore like last Thursday to figure out who they were. I saw they were playing Dematha and Catron Allen, and I don't even think we have Bishop Sycamore in Rivals' database, like as a school, let alone, you know, the, the, the players. So I was a little confused. And if, I think if you go to Max Preps too, I don't, I don't believe a schedule is listed or anything like that. I, I was trying to look that up Thursday. Then when I was watching the game live, of course, on Sunday and, you know, seeing the, the heat that some of the ESPN announcers were giving them, it, it kind of all made sense then because I, I knew nothing about them, um, you know. And, and now we know why. Uh, yeah, now we know why. So feel bad for those players, man. Uh, they're just trying to to get exposure and whatnot. And like I said, it kind of feels like they're being taken advantage of. So hope uh, hope hope those guys who uh, you know are trying to get their names out there. I, I don't know if there's too many Division One guys, but hope they get an opportunity. Uh, you know, at Division Two or whatever it is, those guys that are really trying to actually get to college and and you know make something with themselves. For sure. All right. Well, we're about halfway through this edition of the Blue White Illustrated Penn State Football and Recruiting Podcast. Visit our homepage, bwi.rivals.com, for the latest Penn State news. As we march towards game week, there was recruiting updates, team actions. Uh, our Nate Bauer has a great interview up today with Dwight Gall talking about the freak athletes at Penn State on the football team. That's kind of a playoff of the freak list that Bruce Feldman does for The Athletic. And also, find us wherever you get your audio, get your podcast. We're now on Apple Podcasts. Very excited about that. And YouTube, youtube.com slash Blue White Illustrated for the latest updates, interviews, and much more from Ryan, Nate, David, and I, and the rest of the team at BWI. Ryan, let's move on to a little bit of team talk here. So we're a few days away now from Penn State's trip to Wisconsin. We did, you, Dave, and I did kind of a, a betting preview, season preview show um, not too long ago, and I believe the line was four and a half, Penn State plus four and a half at that point. It's now pretty much a consensus five and a half across the board. Surprising to you? Well, it seems to be a, a trendy pick with Sharps. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I've, I like to pay attention to that stuff a lot, and and that's that's what I've just seen a lot on, you know, different websites that I use and whatnot. It's, it's definitely seems to be trending that way, you know, five and a half. And if that definitely gets a six, it would definitely be a Penn state play for me personally. You know, when we did that gambling pod the other day, I, I did say that I would lean towards Wisconsin at four and a half, five and a half. I, I wouldn't play it personally. And if it got the six, like I said, I, I would probably lean towards Penn state. So a uh, little, I guess a little surprise to see it, but I, I would, ex- especially in the Pennsylvania books, you know, I thought the Pennsylvania books would stay down with all the, all the Penn State fans, uh, and I do think it. I'd be surprised if it got the six. Personally, I, I, I could see it dropping back down to five. Uh, yeah. Four and a half might be a little difficult here with a couple of days to go. Although you know, all that all that public money is going to come in Friday sure. and, and Saturday morning, so it, it could it could get maybe back to four and a half. But yeah, yeah a little so little surprise to see that. I was too. You know, I did. Uh, we'll have a piece later this week on the website, kind of taking a closer look at the matchups involved here, both when Penn State has the ball, when it doesn't have the ball, the coaching side of things, and. You know, Wisconsin's defensive line made a lot of plays last year, and they're breaking in some new guys there. Um, Very good at linebacker, very good at safety. On the other side of the ball, Jake Ferguson's back at tight end. There's a lot of people that really, really think that this offense is going to be more balanced than it typically is in Wisconsin and things like that. But I guess it's just a question of, so what do you buy here? Is Graham Mertz going to outplay Penn State's secondary, which may well be its strength uh, on defense? Um, is Penn State's defensive line going to be able to work uh, effectively against Wisconsin's offensive line, which has some new guys back? It's enormous, and I'm sorry, has some new guys starting, also some guys back, and it is an enormous, you know, 300 plus pound across the board offensive line, just like it seems like Wisconsin has every year. So yeah. I think those are some of the questions you have to ask yourself. To me, five, when we get into five and a half, six, it's getting a little bit too high. I think I said before, but I mean, four and a half was something I'd be interested in. Five and a half, six, certainly. I, I just think that when you look at it across the board, I don't see that wide of a gap between these two teams. I really don't. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, four and I, I, I picked Wisconsin that show. This was in the game I would bet. You know, I, I don't, first of all, I don't, right. I don't really want to say it anyway, but. Uh, I, w- I would stay away from this uh, personally. Just even if you're a Penn State fan or whatnot, you, you don't know 
what to expect from this team. I don't know what to expect from this team. I've been watching practice and talking to coaches and players and whatnot, and I, I have no idea what to expect here in this first game, which is which is why it's going to be so much fun. Um, you know, the matchup, you bring up Mertz against the secondary, and I, I do agree the secondary is probably Penn State's strength, but I, the linebackers, I, I, I'll keep coming back to this. You know, the linebackers were a big reason why Penn State struggled in, in passing defense last year. Um, you know, I think a lot of fans just on the outside looking in, you know, blame different cornerbacks and whatnot, basically everybody but Jaquan Brisker. But, you know, to me, those those intermediate routes, uh, a, a big, big reason for that was just a, a poor pass defense by the linebacker. So, you know, if Mertz can can have success against them, I, I think Penn State will have problems if, if, if that if that linebacker core can improve substantially in, in the passing game. I, I I do give Penn State an edge there, um, you know, against against a, a good quarterback in Mertz, but he's still limited experience, whatnot. He only had a right. handful of games last year, so it's going to be interesting, man. I mean, this is this is to me, this is I think I think four is, is is the right number just because it's at Wisconsin and whatnot, and you know when when you add in that home field advantage. So to me, four four and a half seems like the right number. Uh, if you get six for Penn State, I would play it. But aside from that, if you're I know Penn State fans want to play it, they 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 love they their will, team no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. I, I get it. Um, but uh, just to me, I, I'd stay away. That, that's yeah. The rest of it. Yeah. My my one thought here is this: that uh, I, Graham Mertz, I, I think he's really good, and I enjoyed watching him. I, I think he might be being anointed a little bit too soon here, and I, that's going to be with that, that's going to be the most interesting part of the game. Well, at any rate, we have some recruiting mailbag questions to get to, so we're going to move on there. But first, the latest edition of the Penn State uh, Blue White Illustrated magazine is out to now. You can find it on newsstands. It covers everything from Sean Clifford to David Taylor's Olympic gold medal, a lot of recruiting news, plenty more. If you're interested in that, getting a subscription for our monthly magazine or finding the preseason preview edition, which was 116 pages of up, you know, all the latest info you could need, visit us at comanpub.com slash BWI dash preview or call customer service 814-234-1177 Monday through Friday from 9 to 5. Okay, so if you've been following along with us throughout the summer here at Blue White Illustrated, you've noticed that we are trying to up the amount of interaction we have with our listeners, with our readers, with Penn State fans, etc. So Ryan's uh, Friday mailbag is one of the more popular recruiting features on the site. And we're going to add a recruiting mailbag uh, portion to the podcast, which we debut this week. Uh, some folks on our message board inside the uh, Lions Den Premium Forum, which you can sign up for at bwi.rivals.com for all the latest insight on both the team and recruiting and much more. Uh, again, visit us bwi.rivals.com. But we had some users this week and readers and subscribers who sent in some questions. So we're going to start with this. Longbeard4097 is the username, and he asked, would Penn State take both Andre Roy and Emil Wagner, Ryan, obviously, again, we've talked a lot, space is tight, and two offensive linemen, there might not be room for one. I don't know if there's room for two, but where do you stand on that mm-hmm. question? So, yeah, obviously, they're going to take Roy. If if Roy's ready to commit here in, in you know, whatever it is, three three like weeks or so. They, three they, days, yeah. Yeah, they will, they will take him. And, and it feels like it's leaning that way. I'm still kind of still 50-50. I'm not ready to make a pick personally, but uh, I understand uh, – why, why people would feel good about that situation. Sorry, I didn't put my phone on silent. Anyway, uh, so I, if Roy's part of this class, we'll get to 2025. 20, and the, the thing with Wagner is that he's not playing to decide until the All-American game in, in January. So Penn State has a lot of time to figure things out. And more importantly, I, I still would be kind of surprised if, if one or two players don't decommit at least maybe one and and maybe i'll be wrong with that but just history says that that somebody will end up taking a couple of visits somewhere and and maybe open things up at some point so you know if we get into a situation in december where it's 24 commits and roy's one of them then yes i think wagner is a possibility i i I am confident in saying that wagner is penn state's top guy uh at the offensive line position if they could pick between the two they i think they would lean wagner now don't get me wrong there's not a big gap and, and both of them um you know have their pluses and minuses and, and things they need to work on so neither is a surefire prospect by any means but but i i i would i know phil troutwine would like to make that happen he, he wants to improve his room and especially at the tackle position so is it possible yes if I had to throw a percentage, which I hate doing, but I think it would it's definitely under 50 50, you know, probably like a 20 percent chance that that both of these guys uh, would end up signing. So and the other one last thing is that, you know, we, we do believe Emil Wagner is, is probably leaning towards Notre Dame at this time. Ohio State's kind of 
you know, they were in the mix and it feels kind of like they're, they're focusing on one or two other uh, players or positions at the moment, but the Buckeyes would be there if they, if they want to push hard. So uh, it's just kind of one of those things where you got to see where we stand, you know, a month out from, from his commitment. Uh, I, I do think we'll see Wagner get on campus at some point. He's already taken his official visit, but uh, I'd be surprised if he's not back on campus for a game at some point. Yeah, I'll just make note of the fact that you're not hinting at someone being ready to decommit or anything like that. Just the obvious fact that no. when you look at years and years of recruiting data, you tend to have a couple of decommits that could pop up in Penn State's. Uh, it happens every year. year. It's not, right. It's not just a Penn State thing. You know, right. I mean, guys. It's everywhere thing. Every school has two or three. You know, Penn State's already had one. I I, I think it's, um, you know, I, I, I just, the history says that somebody's probably going to decommit. That's all. Moving on, Scrappy152 asked for the latest on Deny Dennis Sutton's injury. What do you know? What's the latest there? Yeah, of course. Dislocated elbow. He put that out on Twitter. I don't know. What were we at? Three three weeks ago, something like that. I don't think it's quite a month ago, but three weeks ago, we'll say. Uh, I, he will not play in McDonough's season opener against Gonzaga. And the last the last talk I had with, with Deny and, and coaches down there is that he's aiming to play that week two game against Calvert Hall. Um, now, just from talking to some people, I, that may be a bit optimistic. So I think safely, you know, that that game against St. Mary's on September 17th, he should be back for. And I, I would feel confident in saying September 25th against LaSalle College High, which hopefully is a showdown between Abdul Carter and Deny Dennis Sutton, uh, he, he, he will be um, playing. So right now, like I said, Calvert Hall kind of seems 50-50. That's that week two game, uh, September 11th. feel a little bit about St. Mary's, but September 25th, he should absolutely be back. Uh, well, a question from Twitter. Going by player ratings, what position group has James Franklin recruited best and worst? I know you were doing a little bit of math to try and put some Fine. some some numbers behind your opinion here, but what say you to that question? Yeah, so I, I tried to skim through this a bit uh, when I when I saw this question. I thought it was a pretty good question, something we don't always talk about a bit. You know, if you I think if you ask most Penn State fans, right, they would say running back and tight end. Is that what you would say, Greg? Uh, off the top of your head so in terms of best well, yes yeah 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 and, and and it makes sense now running back is definitely the case when you look at ratings uh it's a seven seven to two four star to three star ratio I, I that is when i went through i didn't go through you know uh closely to every little detail but skimming it and, and the little math i put together that is that de- that is definitely the best uh ratio of four to four to four to three star players uh, at any position you know, but tight ends not not as highly ranked. It's it's four to four, um, and as far as you know, like I said, four four star or three star player. Now, yep. uh, you know, a couple of those three stars: Jonathan Holland, Nick Bowers, Danny Dalton. You know, they they were pretty early on. So in recent years, the recruiting at tight end has been a lot better. And Khalil Dinkins was a three star last year, but he was someone I know. Uh, you know, Penn State sources were telling me that that this was a normal year, and you know, he got out the camps and whatnot. That that kid would have not have been a four star. And I will note that he's a player who. Uh, people are speaking very highly of uh, in, in his first uh, couple weeks on campus. So it's it's definitely fair to say that that running back has been their best position. Uh, tight end has been okay, uh, but there are some there are also better ones. Like for example, uh, offensive line is a sixteen to to ten ratio, a four star to three star. I thought that that actually kind of surprised me a bit. I thought it would be a little closer to even. Uh, yeah. So they've done a pretty good job there. Defensive tackle is eight to eight, so pretty pretty even there. Um, Defensive end, six to, six to nine, four star to three star. So that's a little lower than I think a lot of fans would expect. Um, of course, like Sharif Miller was a was a three star. Hakeem Beeman was a three star. Uh, Smith Vilbert, you know, those guys still have to prove themselves a bit. But um, you know, I think I think Beeman and we know Miller was obviously a pretty good player, so they were underranked. Uh, linebacker, nine to seven ratio, and that that one. Uh, when you look at you know who who were the four stars, and of course Michael Parsons was a five star, and then who were the three stars? That actually. Uh, they, they were graded out pretty well as far as who who you know made it and who who didn't. Uh, cornerback is six to seven, uh, safety is eight to six, so pretty even in the defensive backfield. Uh, you notice I left out quarterback, and this this is probably where I would say would be their worst. It's it's three to five, um, four star to three star, and um, to some degree I, I think you kind of you kind of see that on the field a little bit. Of course, Sean Clifford was a was a four star, but it's more so the depth I'm referring to. Uh, you know, they, they they don't feel like they have a ton of depth there, and you kind of see that a bit. So, you know, I would lean towards uh, towards running back being the best, 
and and probably quarterback being the worst. Uh, although you could also make the case the defensive end, which is a six to nine ratio, is is down there as well. But you know, as you always know, as fans know, you know, there, there's a ton of three stars who end up emerging and being awesome players. So the rankings only mean so much. It's the best projection that uh, you know we we can do leading up to it. But you're always going to have guys who slip through the cracks. Yeah, there's no question about that. All right, one final one here before we wrap up, Brian. Uh, Penn State fan in Texas wants to know, will Ohio State come after Drew Alar? You've been asked this about maybe a thousand times over the last month, so just run us really quickly through where things stand there. Yeah, uh, so I hit on this in the mailbag. I think two. I think my last two mailbags, we, we've hit on this a, a bit. And, uh, you know, I, I checked in with uh, two Ohio State colleagues. Uh, was it past, past Thursday when I was writing our most recent mailbag? And, uh, Ohio State hasn't made any moves at quarterback nationally at all um, with any quarterback that anyone's aware of. So it feels right now that Ohio State's pretty content with their situation. Uh, now, with that said, a lot of the the people in Ohio believe that it's Drew Alar or bust, that, that they won't go after anyone. My last conversation with Drew, uh, maybe about a week and a half ago, I would say, maybe, yeah, probably about, probably about 10 days or so, uh, Ohio State had not to reach out to him. And of course, he's saying all the right things. You know, I, I have no, no, no reason to leave the class. Hundred percent locked in. You know, the, the, the tweet and all that stuff. So, I, I don't see anything right now that tells me Drew Lar is going to leave. I, first off, I, I need to see Ohio State reach out to him before I even, you know, consider it a possibility. And right now, the Blue guys haven't done that. So, I think Penn State fans have have a lot to feel good about. But, you know, obviously, we have what September, October, November, and, and half of December still. So, let's see how things shape up. All right, Ryan, we covered a lot of ground on this edition of the Blue White Illustrated Penn State Football and Recruiting Podcast. He's Ryan Snyder. I'm Greg Pickle. Give us a follow on Twitter. Make sure you subscribe and hit that bell on YouTube to get the latest videos as they appear. You'll see the BWI Daily, our podcast, much more uh, on the Penn State football and Penn State athletics fronts. Let me add one thing. The, the BWI Daily today is really good, too. Uh, with uh, T. Frank did a great job catching up with the guys from Badger Blitz, so definitely check that out. And uh, thanks, everybody, for following us on uh, on Apple Podcasts. Uh, you, you guys have been awesome over the first week. We, we've gotten, I think, twice the amount of downloads that, that we had uh, the week before, and, and, and it keeps growing. So just thank you guys on, on Apple Podcasts. Uh, rate and review, only good ones, though. All right? I appreciate it. All right. For Until next time, we'll have plenty of coverage from the rest of the week. News conferences getting underway a little bit later. Obviously, Penn State, Wisconsin set for noon at Camp Randall. Uh, kickoff set for uh, noon on Fox. So we'll talk to you before then, during the game, and afterward. He's Ryan Snyder. I'm Greg Pickle. And thank you for joining us for this edition of the Blue White Illustrated Penn State Football and Recruiting Podcast.